We had a pleasant surprise last season going 7-1, and one, but after two consecutive losses and injuries to our star quarterback, star linebacker, and what looked to be our future star wide receiver, we finished the season 9-7 and seven and were one and done in the playoffs. I am extremely proud of this team on a tank year and they managed to make it a bank year because the season ended up being straight cash homie. Before we continue, I wanted to show some of the players we traded away this past season. Willie McGinnis didn't do much in Pittsburgh. That's disappointing. You know I like trading players that will have some play time or impact on the team that they're going to. Jermaine Duff was absolutely worth it, even if we have to give him a new contract. Same with Mazzarella Perella. Turns out Baltimore runs a 3-4 defense and he's their backup. We got a second for him. Barry Sims did get some play time in Arizona only allowing two sacks on the season. We also got a second for him. I wanted to point out that Kennedy signed with the Lions where he had a better season but he was injured. Funny enough he was reunited with Baskin Robbins who is who he is which isn't necessarily a bad thing. We're back in the green again. I'm still unsure how the cap works in this game. I know it increases, but player salaries are also here under expenses, but our total revenue is only for the stadium maintenance and staff, so I don't understand why it's here other than to confuse me. If you know why, let me know, please, because I don't know how it works in this. The last time this team was given this much support was when Marcus Tuiasis Sopo was starting on this team in year two. We had a lot of home games to start the season, but even towards the back half of the year when we were losing, the fans were showing up. A lot of the success has to be owed to the coaching staff. Jim Johnson has turned this team around in less than a season. I won't say much about Sean Payton because the offense wasn't exactly top 10, but he stuck to the ground game even if it was only getting 3.3 yards a carry. Capers is a great defensive coordinator who helps a lot with his experience, while Darren Simmons, who by the way is still coaching for the Cincinnati Bengals, he's got to be doing something right if he's been there for 20 years. After the surprise season they had there, progressions were going all around, especially for Jim Johnson, and since we had them all under contract this year, there's no reason for me to go looking for coaches that are available, but I should have because I noticed something interesting. Callahan was hired by the Texans. He's been given an opportunity to show how mid he is. I do find it interesting that all of the coaches in the AFC West have been replaced, except for Shanahan. He's still with the Broncos while Vermeil went off to New Orleans. Brad Johnson was the Chargers coach. Yes, Players can come back as coaches. I'm just surprised they hired him as a head coach. Oh, and uh, Bill Belichick is here with his, um, is your mother home face? Um, now I see why he doesn't participate in these games anymore. Before we move on to retirement, I'm back to being a good owner. Turns out all you need to do is win. Another season with no retirements. That was expected this time. I don't think we have anyone on the team that's older than 33. We're looking good for the next three seasons at the very least. Since we have no retirements, let's go around the league. Marvin Harrison tried to go for one last ride with the Green Bay Packers who were coming off a Super Bowl appearance but failed to make it without Brett Favre. Clearly the reason Harrison went to a Favre-less Packers was because of of the money. Dana Stubblefield retired with a 70 rating. That, it was a smart idea to move on from him. Warwick, well done, retired. He wasn't very good in this game, but I attribute that more to him splitting carries. Going to a team that has a running back by committee can ruin a running back's career in this game. Larry Allen is also retiring. He's not good. 
like at all. But I wonder if this is because he was turned into a backup or if injuries did that to him. I have no idea. John Lynch is retiring at the same time he did in real life. He'll be making his way to the 49ers GM spot in um 10 years. While Mike Allstott is one scary man. This dude was a 2k5 beast. Jake Plummer is retiring, but the Broncos haven't started him for the past three seasons. Drew Bledsoe's retirement interests me. I want to see if they can still circle the wagon. They made it to the Super Bowl in back-to-back -back seasons. Can they do it one more time without him? Quick shout out to John Kitna, my first quarterback I traded for, my first rebuild with the Dolphins. Aaron Glenn also retired at the age of 36, which means I have at least five more seasons with Woodson. John Randall retired at the age of 40. 40! Let that sink in. I've never seen a player in Madden that wasn't a kicker or punter last until that age. I am shocked. Shout out to the Madden NFL 2001 cover boy. He was still doing pretty good, but then again, Eddie George was the master of averaging three yards a carry. Another big quarterback retirement, Kurt Warner is calling it at the age of 37, which by the way, he had one of his best seasons ever. 22 touchdowns, one interception and of course he was injured that year. Isaac Bruce decided that he would rather retire than have to play without Warner. He's 35 while Harrison was 36. I guess that confirms when receivers retire in this game even at their peak. Moving on over to the resigning period at quarterback both Nelson and JT O'Sullivan aren't under contract anymore. Cedric Nelson, wait I thought his name was Craig this entire time. Well then Cedric wasn't a terrible backup last season. I mean, he only won two games last year and threw four interceptions in the wild card. Okay, he was bad. I think it's best that both parties move on. JT O'Sullivan. I think it's obvious. He's not coming back. At running back, Larry Johnson is the only player who needs a new contract. He's declined. He was relegated to the backup position this past season. Was splitting carries his first year with the team. He's still only 28, but with how he's been performing... It's time to move on. He's not coming back. At fullback, Erickson needs a contract. There's no argument here. He's our greatest weapon on offense. Of course he's coming back. At wide receiver, there are two players who need a new contract. Obviously, Nate Burleson, who we signed on a one-year deal last season when Caldwell went down, the other player being Duffman. Well, he ended up being a lot better than I thought he'd be for the team. I'm glad this trade worked out for us, and it even looked like he improved, which seems to be hard to do for receivers, but he just fits in this scheme. I'm going to bring him back to continue to be our starting receiver. Burleson can get out of here. He was a terrible panic signing. He gone. At tight end, we do have a holdout with Jolly while Schultz was a free agent I signed last year just for the tank year. He's not going to be returning. Jolly, on the other hand, I had just signed him last season and now he wants an even bigger contract. Is there even an argument to be made here? He's been our most consistent player on offense. There's no reason not to give him a new contract. At left tackle, we have Douglas in need of a new contract. He was never good. I had high hopes to uh, develop him, but it's hard to develop talent when, you know, they're not on the field. So he's not going to be returning at left guard. We have Brett Harris on an expired contract. He's an average lineman. I could draft his replacement. I could sign his replacement. The point is he's replaceable. At center, we have both our players here who need new contracts. Dwayne Hendricks had a down season, but with more playing time under his belt, he's improved dramatically. I'm going to bring him back. I did have a realization here that if he goes down, I would like to have a decent player behind him and not have to worry about signing or drafting a guy, which made me go back and sign Harris. I don't want to have to worry about signing a free agent or wasting a pick on a player that might not be as good when I could draft someone better at a different position which also meant that Ernie Brown is a viable option. He did come in for a few plays last season until the backups proved 
proof they can't be backups like Nelson, then I'm going to re-sign him. Mo Collins was in a holdout this season. I guess he realized how important he is to the growth of the younger players. He did have his best season this past year. I can't really argue that he doesn't deserve it. Plus, redoing his contract will add an additional 1 million to our cap which is already high, he's really doing us a solid more than anything else. At left end, we have number 98 in need of a new contract. Again, he hasn't given us a reason not to give him a new contract. The past two seasons have been consistent. Other than his injured season, he's had 27 sacks in three years. That's really good. Of course I'm bringing him back. At middle linebacker, Ted Johnson needs a new contract. He was another panic signing that happened last season in the middle of the year. There's really no reason to bring him back with Napoleon Harris being healthy going into the season. He won't be returning. At right outside linebacker, Randy Rogers needs a new contract. He's really our left outside linebacker. He's been great since we've drafted him. He's absolutely been my favorite player that we've drafted so far in this series. He's coming back. At cornerback, we have two players who need a new contract, Buchanan and Asamoa. Buchanan has been great for the team, and let's be honest, he helped us win those playoff games the first year in the series because of his returning abilities. Though he did hurt us in the Titans game. He's a lockdown corner with Charles Woodson. I think I can squeeze another five years of elite play with those two. I'm bringing him back. Namdi, on the other hand, was injured the year before and then we found his replacement. He's not coming back. The final player that needs a new contract is Derek Gibson. He who was once the worst player in our secondary is now elite. He's returning. Now we'll only be one player away from having an all elite secondary. I didn't think there were going to be a lot of players this season who needed a new contract, but I was wrong. And I do expect a few to sign with a new team and free agency. Now we started here with just over 40 million in cap, but have now just under 20 25 million to work with for free agency and the draft. Now before we head over to the draft though, there were still some players I wanted to release, Fargus being one of them. He's regressed extremely hard. I don't see a reason to keep him on the team anymore. He gone. Dez White is a player who's been decent with the team, but he's not worth the contract at this point. If we release him, we can get back over 4 million in cap. He gone. The last player I released was Parkman. He's just not a very good right guard. We already have two other players there. It's a no-brainer move to let him go. He gone. All these moves have now got us over 30 million in cap. I think you know what I'm planning on doing this year. And there are some of the players in free agency that caught my eye like Fred Taylor. I know, I know it wouldn't make any sense to sign him. I know we have John Bird, but imagine how good the ground game would be if we average more than 3.3 yards a carry. Steve McNair was also available. I could sign him as a backup, but let's be honest, he's probably looking for a starting job somewhere. Buffalo, maybe? I also was interested in Amani Toomer. He's the best receiver available. I almost traded for him two years ago when I was debating getting Favre. He's regressed quite a bit then, but with Duffman being our number one this year, Caldwell coming off an injury, and Robinson not being a true starter, I might sign Toomer. But we'll worry about that after the draft. And this year, we have our lowest pick since our first draft, the 22nd selection which means any receiver that I wanted to get that might be good to start day one is out of the question. There also weren't any players that caught my eye that I felt was worth a first rounder, so I decided to trade away our first round pick for a receiver, and trust me, I made sure to ask everyone. Marty Booker, Randy Moss, Andre Johnson, Jabari Gaffney, Plexico Burris, Corn Robinson, Dante Stallworth, Lavernius Cold, Rod Gardner, Javon Walker, Donald Driver, Charles Rogers. In the end... I felt like there was only one player worth trading that could be realistic enough to happen in real life. Terrell Owens. 
coming off back-to-back 1,000-yard -back seasons but no longer with Jeff Garcia on the team, imagine what he could do with a quarterback like Ron Douglas. I know some may not agree with this, but he's 34. We just discovered that players retire at 35-36. This could be his final year. Why not get something of value for him for the future while we try to push for a Super Bowl run this year? I think a common trend in the Callahan era was the hesitation to make a move, hesitated to sign Favre, hesitated to trade for Toomer, hesitated to trade for Brunel, where I will continue to say that we would have made the playoffs in year two and three if we had him. The Jim Johnson era has been much more different when it comes to making moves. No more hesitation. We're trading our first for a one-year rental of Terrell Owens. By the way, the 49ers used that pick to select a wide receiver. Yeah, we weren't going to find a player like T.O. this late in the draft. We go back to our draft and with our first second round pick that we received in the Arizona trade, ninth pick overall in the second round, we selected a defensive tackle. Derek Watts is exactly the kind of player we needed to hit on with these draft picks. Let's be honest though, what holes do we really have on this team besides wide receiver? We just fixed that problem with the TO trade. The next holes are the offensive tackles, defensive tackles, which we just filled and running back. Don't get me wrong, I want my holes to be filled as much as the next person, but more importantly, we need to have solid depth in case of injury, which means with our second second round pick, we selected a right tackle, Jason Butler. We don't have anyone behind McCormack, and this player solves that problem. I know that drafting a backup with a second round pick sounds ridiculous, that's because it kind of is. You want to draft starters in this round, but it's a good problem to have because it means that we are no longer building for the future. We're building for right now and these players ensure that if an injury happens, we can trust these guys to carry us the rest of the way. With our final second round pick that we got from the Baltimore trade, we selected Tommy Spoto. With Namdi Asamoah no longer on the team, this player becomes his replacement. He's already better than him and has room to improve. I like all these draft picks so far. What do you think? In the third round, I ended up drafting a right guard. I just released Parkman before the draft. I didn't feel comfortable with him with how low he was rated, but with this selection, I feel a little bit better if Collins goes down for a game or two. In the fourth round, I decided to go middle linebacker since we lacked depth there when Harris ended up getting injured for the regular season. I didn't realize this when I drafted him initially, but I drafted the John Madden. He's a Raider again. <laughs> How perfect is that? Like, I kid you not, I had no clue that that was his name until I saw his player card. In the fifth round, I selected a tight end. I just wanted a player that was better than Schultz, and that's that's it, really. In the sixth round, I selected John Lewis. I wasn't very happy with how poor Williams did last season. I was extremely hyped for him, and he didn't do as well as I had hoped. This is a backup plan? In the final round, I drafted a punter, Phil Cannon. How can this guy not succeed in the NFL with a name like that? Either way, I drafted him to let my kicker and punter know that I would We'll move on from them if they continue to perform poorly. I know it's been a while, but I wanted to show Mark McGrath. Remember, the other player that's forever connected with Ron Douglas? It's clear that he has a cannon for an arm, but he's not the most careful with it. That's the reason why I'm glad I selected Douglas over him. Let's move on to free agency where we're no longer Hesitation Jones over here. We're gonna sign whoever we want whenever we want. I want Fred Taylor. I just don't know if I should sign him. We have Bird, who's looking like a solid draft pick, but at the same time, maybe Fred Taylor can be our Corey Dillon when he went to New England. He can really help beef up our running game. 
Screw it, no more hesitation. I gave him a three year offer. Dallas tried to outbid me, but I'm determined to have him on this team. I did want to sign McNair, but that wouldn't make any sense at all. Even as a backup, he'd be a heck of a backup to have, but I feel like a player of his caliber would want to be a starter somewhere. I did give offers to two quarterbacks, Anthony Lewis and Darnell Shaw. They're just depth signings. I would like a capable backup, but I want a accurate backup more than anything else. Now, I was still interested in signing Amani Toomer, even with Owens on the team, but I decided to pass on that because I wanted to save the money for something else, something even more head scratching. I wanted to sign Grant Wistrom. He would easily turn this defense from elite to untouchable. We're on the no hesitation highway in Wistrom. You've just hopped on for a ride. We were able to sign both Taylor and Wistrom to the team, but we had to release two players before we could add Lewis and Shaw because we hit the 55 player cap. With Wistrom on the team, we don't need Tony Bryant anymore, while Michael Owens has been getting a free paycheck for the past three seasons. He gone, which now means we can sign those two backup quarterbacks to the team. I did want to show that Amani Toomer ended up signing with the Rams, replacing Isaac Bruce. Namdi Asamoa went off to Atlanta. We will no longer have the combination of Larry Bird on the team as Larry Johnson will be off to Green Bay, while Nelson goes off to Pittsburgh and McNair replaces Warner in St. Louis. We also earned a one-year media contract thanks to our playoff appearance last season. We're now at the roster going into the season and once again Eric Barden is leading the class. I think he's hit his peak, but there's very few players better than him and he's an original on this team. Shane Leckler's awareness went up slightly, but other than that he's still the same. He's still elite, but with the way he's been performing with his cost, it's getting easier to consider moving on from him. This could be his final year on the team. The same could be said about Seabass. He's been inconsistent in the past two seasons and this has become his prove it year with the team. Also, have you noticed the past three players are in their 30s? Napoleon Harris may not be 30, but he's getting there. At 29, I think he's also hit his peak on this team. His production does frustrate me, but overall I think I'd rather have him on the team than not. Charles Woodson has become a 10 year vet. How did he ever survive 10 years? He did so by being a ball hawk, but his time is coming soon soon. The best time for a Super Bowl push is now, which is the reason why I signed Grant Wistrom. The dude is an elite player and with how good our secondary is performing, I expect Wistrom to have the best season ever in his career this year. Another older original on the team at the age of 32, Roderick Coleman shows no signs of slowing down. The window for the Super Bowl will be open for the next five years, so we need to make sure we get a ladder and creep on in. Philip Buchanan is the youngest player on the elite list. He's also an original on the team, one of the biggest reasons we won the Super Bowl in year one one, but also the biggest reason we lost the wild card in year five. He truly is a boom or bust player. More booming than busting though. Derek Gibson finally made his way into the elite list of players. He's almost 30. There seems to be a trend and that trend is our players are getting old, which is why I signed an even older player to take over at running back. Look, if the window for the Super Bowl is now, then I want the best I can get for that run, and Fred Taylor is the best. Ron Douglas continues to improve, and had he not gotten injured, I believe he would have made it to the elite list of players this season, but I'll take an 89. Yeah, our backups aren't better than Nelson, but I think the drop off from him isn't that much worse. I just hope that Douglas doesn't and get injured because if he gets injured again, our season is over. 7-3 and three with him and each game he's lost was less than a touchdown each time. Plus the third game he lost was when he was injured. So really he's 7-2. and two. Fred Taylor will be the starting running back going into the season. That goes without saying, but John Bird got strong. I do think he's the future, but I'm more concerned about winning now. Plus if an injury happens, I'm not too concerned about Bird having to come in for a few games in his absence. The mystery of the fullback still eludes me. Even though I don't know what he does, 
he's doing a darn good job at it. Terrell Owens instantly helps out this receiving core. I was afraid that Caldwell was going to regress after the season, and that was exactly what happened. But with the progress of Duffman, I think going into the season, it would make sense to have T.O. be the number one, Duffman be the number two, while Robinson will continue to be in the number three, have Caldwell and Curtis be the two players on reserve if an injury is to happen. Doug Jolly may not be elite, but like Terrell Owens, he's very close to getting there. Unlike Owens, Jolly has never been in the 90s, but I think he can do it next season. The depth behind him is also much better since Schultz has been replaced by the rookie Norman. Walker is getting worse and worse at left tackle, but that's okay because Floyd is coming into his own in this position. The offensive line used to be the biggest strength, but we're trying to develop for the future and it starts by slowly developing these young guys. It helps to have a player like Middleton at some point I'll have to move on from him but that's going to have to wait until Floyd can get a bit better. I'm not comfortable moving on from Middleton yet especially during these next few years where we're pushing for a deep playoff run. The biggest improvement amongst the young offensive linemen that we have has definitely been Dwayne Hendricks. He's clearly going to be the leader of this offensive line when the veterans leave or retire in a few years. It's interesting how much Parkman had regressed going into the past offseason which is why I let him go, but I'm still happy to have drafted Romberg. I do think Mo Collins is very young in this game for an offensive lineman, but maybe I could trade him for something down the road. McCormack is another much improved player on this offensive line. We also have a pretty good player behind him that we drafted, Butler. If an injury happens at all to this offensive line, I'm okay with all the backups so far. I think the depth going into the season is the best it's ever been in a long time. We might be getting to a point where number 98 may be hitting his ceiling, but that's alright. I'm not too concerned about that as long as he continues to give productive seasons. I like high ratings, but I focus more on production. This right here is the reason why I wanted to sign Wistrom to the team. I thought he had a very mid season last year, and having Wistrom come in and show him how it's done could be very beneficial. It doesn't hurt to have a strong rotation of players along with decent depth if the player has to miss a few games. Remember when I mentioned how good our depth is this season? Yeah, they're not in the 90s, but that doesn't mean that they can't be in their 90s in a few years. Coleman is doing a great job teaching these young players how it's done. I'm impressed how quickly I turned this position around after trading Mozzarella and Stubblefield. Have I mentioned our depth is the best it's been in years? Bailey is going to be the backup again this season, but it really goes to show that if players need to come in and play, it's not game over. Napoleon Harris is our middle linebacker, but I feel confident enough that John Madden can come in and take over if another injury happens to Harris this season. I wonder if not having good depth the past few years is the reason we could never get over the hump? You know, I thought Rodgers might have begun to hit his peak, but I think he hasn't even begun to peak. Him at left outside linebacker, Harris in the middle, and Barton at the right is dangerous. This team is good, like really good at every position on this defense. I mean, just look at our secondary. It's gotten better again. Woodson has hit his peak, but Buchanan continues to get better and the trade for Citroen ended up being a steal. I really do feel like it's now or never to start pushing for a Super Bowl run. Norton antivirus continues to develop and the depth behind him is good. Remember, this team was 7-3 when Douglas started every loss but one last season was a one possession game. This defense will always give the team a chance to win as long as Douglas is healthy, they'll be in the playoffs. Something, something, worst player in our secondary. Yeah, the starters, the depth, the team, I'm very confident in everything going into this season. I trust Jim Johnson to get us our first playoff win since year one. One. Sebastian Janikowski is the kicker, Shane Leckler is the punter, but probably not for long. One last thing before we start the season, 
No injuries from the preseason. Douglas has yet to lose a season opener. It's his fourth year in the league. Let's see if he can go 4-0. Wasn't even close. And if there's something to be said, it's that this season all falls onto Douglas. He had a three touchdown game. Both Bird and Taylor split carries, which tells me that Taylor may be prone to injuries. But this is why you need good depth. Either way, both had over four yards to carry. Even though Terrell Owens didn't get a touchdown, he was one of our top receivers. Receivers, Duffman and Jolly Rancher being the other two guys. Seabass with a four field goal performance? Oh, is he good again? We now take on the Dolphins in week two and it'll be the second ever meeting between Douglas and McGrath. Douglas winning the first matchup in a defensive struggle. Another blowout win it wasn't even close again. Douglas didn't have a great performance but it was better than McGrath and that's all that really matters. Now we got an opportunity to see Fred Taylor as a true bell cow this week. And it looks so nice, doesn't it? 100 yards in a full game, he's he's gonna be so good this year. Terrell Owens got his first touchdown as a Raider. He's looking really good so far, while Seabass missed a kick, but out of four, not bad. While Grant Wistrom now has three sacks in two games, these big names I acquired this season are putting in the work. We now have our first divisional matchup against the Jack Del Rio Chiefs. Another 30 point game that wasn't even close. Douglas truly is a difference maker on this team. When he's in, they're dominant. When he's out, this defense has to work hard for a win. Another game where the carries were split, which indicates Taylor is a bit fresh. Fragile. Bird did perform better, but those fumbles need to be cleaned up. While Terrell Owens had a four touchdown performance worth the first round pick for this game alone. Seabass with another missed kick, while number 98 went off with a three sack performance. This team is just dominant. Unfortunately, three weeks into the season and Fred Taylor is out with a partially torn MCL. Which is, it's fine, it's fine because we have Bird, we have Bird, and Taylor should be good to go for the playoffs while Collins dislocated his wrist, but he'll be able to play this week, which will be against the New England Patriots. Fred Taylor was really doing a lot of heavy lifting on this team, wasn't he? Douglas had a mid-performance, but Tom Brady tore up part our secondary. Our running game went back down to averaging under four yards a carry. Taylor truly was the difference maker on this team. Of course, New England would be the team to shut down T.O. completely. Now we have another injury. Mo Collins, great, dislocated his wrist so hard that he broke his collarbone. I wonder what had more of an impact, Collins or Taylor? This is exactly why I drafted Romberg. I guess that means I'm more than likely going to move on from Collins at the end of the season. After a bye week, we had our second ever matchup against the Trestman led Bills. Can we win it this time? I don't like that we're struggling to win games without Taylor and Collins. We were blowing teams away and now Douglas is struggling to even play. Hopefully this is just a down game. John Bird is looking like a fine replacement in Taylor's absence. Janikowski missed another field goal but made more than enough to win the game for us. Let's see if we can shake off these terrible performances against the Brad Johnson led Chargers. We're 8-2 against them all time in the series. It was a better performance especially for Douglas, a bit upsetting that he wasn't able to finish the game. Bird is back at it with his 3 yards a carry average. Taylor was the engine keeping this offense firing on all cylinders. Seabass with another missed kick. Wistrom with another two sack performance. Of course. Douglas is out with an injury. It's only two weeks but you never know if these two games will be the reason we don't get into the playoffs. We're 12 and 4 with Douglas as our starting quarterback the past two seasons. 2 and 5 without him. I don't have high hopes against the Saints. I tell you, the defense has to work especially hard when we have our backups in the game. Two touchdowns would have won the game for us. We got one, Anthony Lewis with a below average performance. John Bird is struggling to stay over three. The defense had four interceptions and it still wasn't enough for the offense to get something going. That means we're now two and six without Douglas. Surely it's, it's not going to be as bad against the Browns. It was worse. It was worse against the Browns. Douglas truly is the 
reason why we're even competitive on offense, and Fred Taylor with Mo Collins is the reason why we're dominant. Look at that. AJ Touchy Feely beat us. That's not good. <laughs> Imagine if I had signed McNair to be our backup. I think we win these two games. Bird with a better performance, but those fumbles have me worried now. We do get Douglas back this week, and obviously no, I don't think McNair as a backup is the best idea, but hey, those two losses could hurt us in the end. 12 and 4 with Douglas, 2 and 7 without him. I think it's clear that you need a quarterback in this game to be a winning franchise. Let's see if that holds true against the Falcons. We shut out the Falcons. I think it has been driven into the ground at this point. If you don't have a quarterback, you're not going to win many games. It helps to have an elite defense like ours. Douglas is shaking off the rust, and the defense had five interceptions in this game. John Bird being ran into the ground once again. This was was why I wanted Fred Taylor. I'm okay running him into the ground since his average would have been higher than three. Charles Woodson with a four interception performance. The news of his regression have been greatly exaggerated. We're so far undefeated against the division this year. Kansas City is up next. We're still undefeated against the division, but I'm not liking how we're struggling without Taylor and Collins on the offense. Douglas is doing better. Bird with his trademark three yard average. The defense did have a really good game. They carried us for sure on this one. Another starter on this team is out. Philip Buchanan will miss a month of games. He should be back for the playoffs and those draft picks from the past year are putting in some overtime. Depth has been hugely important so far this year. And of course the year that we're dominating we have a 7-3 record and we're not even running away with the division. The Broncos are right there with us. This week we'll be against them for sole ownership of the division. Guys, I think this could be our year. We easily put them away. We're getting Taylor back soon, probably not next week, but he's getting healthier. The passing game wasn't the most impressive, but John Bird had a breakout game. He had one last season. He's shown flashes, but he just hasn't been able to put it all together yet. Terrell Owens also went off. He's been quiet since his four touchdown performance, and I still think he was worth the first round pick. Things were going too well for this team right now. Taylor will still be out with Buchanan. Cannon, but now Barton made his way on here with the most dangerous player on the team, Erickson. They should be ready to go for the playoffs though. We now take on the New York Jets, and a win here will give us our second straight winning season. Back to back winning seasons for us gang, first time that's happened in this series. Douglas has been performing very erratically since his return from injury. I wonder if the injury to Collins has been much more hurtful to him than I thought. John Bird knows his time as a starter for this season is coming to an end soon, and wants to prove he can be a bell cow. A cowbell? I think he proved it. Spencer Baker came in for an injured Barden and just started feasting. <laughs> Mr. Irrelevant turning into Mr. Reliable today. Looking at the conference record, we're still one game from first, one game ahead of the Broncos, and there's still four games to go and in the final stretch of games, and at this point, it's to determine seeding. Every win matters, and every loss hurts even more. They lost to the Colts in a close game. Defense couldn't stop Peyton Manning from making a comeback, but Anthony Lewis came in for Douglas and looked like the second coming of Rich Gannon. The running game has been good enough all season, but all those fumbles have really hurt the team. Terrell Owens showing that there is still some youth inside that body of his. Have you seen him lately? The dude's chiseled out of marble still. Spencer Baker showing up on the top of this list again for the second straight week. Should I move on from Barton? We're now taking on the 2 and 11 bucks. We, we shouldn't. We Please don't lose this. I'm a little upset it took until the fourth quarter to put him away, but a win is a win. Look at Douglas starting to feel like himself again. The running game was, well, it was terrible. We need Taylor back for the playoffs to be competitive for sure. That's why we shouldn't move on from Barden. Baker may be good, but Barden is that much better. Believe it or not, we still have a chance to make the number one seed or fall down to the number five seed. 
seed. Let's see if we can at least keep our number two seed with a win against the Chargers this week. Again, this defense has been helping us win games all year long. Once Collins went down with Taylor, this offense became normal again. I'm not used to winning with less than 20 points, knowing how explosive this offense could have been. Douglas has been terrible since his return from injury. I do think Collins going down may have affected that. While we finally get Fred Taylor back and he looks pedestrian, was Collins the MVP of this team? It's not like the offense wasn't able to move the ball down the field, and the defense has been doing a lot of the heavy lifting this season once the injuries at the start of the year happened. We are guaranteed to make the playoffs, but we also have a chance to lead the conference with a win and a New England loss. By the way, it doesn't matter if we win or lose because we've won the division regardless if we split with the Broncos this week. We've clinched the number two seed. We do have the final game of the year again, which means we could check to see if New England and loses, then the game has meaning. If they won, we should probably bench our starters. Can the lowly Bledsoe-less Bills led by Trestman do us a solid one more time? No, they can't. I should bench my starters, but I want to beat the Broncos and have a clean sweep in the division. I also want to screw up their seeding so they have a tougher matchup. I'm keeping the starters in this week. I should have benched them. I'm so surprised how bad this offense has become once Collins went down. It's been a while, but is that what a 4.0 average looks like? Bird rarely had those performances. Seabass missed a kick. A kick that would have won this game. Of course. Well, we finished with a 11-5 record. Those two games that Douglas missed turned out to be very important. If he plays those two games, I think we win. We finished 13-3 with home field advantage. Instead, the road to the Super Bowl will go through New England. That's if we both make it that far. And of course, because I didn't bench them, someone got injured. Roderick Coleman will be out for the divisional round. This year was the year for Douglas to show that he can be the leader of this team, and I think he did a good job. I mainly say that because without him, the team was terrible. We're 18 and 6 with him, and only one of those losses was a blowout. We're 2 and 7 without him, and it's clear that he has an impact on this team. He's also been consistently better the past two seasons under Johnson than he was under Callahan. The running game has been drastically changed under Johnson. John Bird once again got most of the work load this season. He didn't start in three games this year. He did more this season with less and I'm very happy with the growth of Bird. We sacrificed Johnson for Bird. Now we sacrificed Taylor for him. I wouldn't be surprised to see him close to the mid 80s next year. I do think Fred Taylor could have had a 16 plus season had Collins not gotten injured because this offense was booming in the beginning and there's only so much I can control and injuries aren't one of them. I was a bit let down with the passing game, but I don't think the offense focuses on that as much as Callahan's scheme, even though Terrell Owens had two 1,000 yard seasons before coming here. He seems to have regressed back to his previous season's performances, which is fine because he was still a threat to turn nothing into something, having the most receiving touchdowns since year one, I believe. Jermaine Duff has proved he can be a solid receiver in this league. It took him a while to find his footing, but I'm glad I took a chance on him. This is one of the few times the receiver worked out for us. I think we've seen the peak that Jolly can give to the team. We now have weapons again, which means he won't be used as much as he was in the earlier seasons, but he'll get the ball enough to still be helpful on this offense. Melvin Robinson is also proving to me that he's exactly who I thought he was, a player that isn't a starter, but decent depth that can come in when needed. Rache Caldwell is the biggest what if in this series. Had he not gotten injured the year before, I truly believe he would would have been our number one or at least our number two with T.O. on the team. Kevin Curtis is also doing a decent job. His job is really just to come in whenever our players need a breather and he's doing it well. I honestly can't believe how well our offensive line did this season. Yeah, Collins got injured but only one player had more than 10 sacks allowed. Rich Floyd is doing pretty decent. He's not an all pro but he just needs to not be awful. This is why I was willing to take a chance on Hendrick. He has improved drastically 
drastically and I fully expect him to have a holdout next season. Frank Middleton has also been one of the most consistent players and our oldest player on this line. The biggest surprise is Eugene Romberg filling in for the injured Mo Collins. He performed very well. I can see myself moving on from Collins, but at the same time, we kind of need him. Casper McCormack replaced the legend of Lincoln Kennedy and became a legend himself. I don't think Kennedy has ever had a season like this. Mo Collins was having the best season of his career before getting injured. It sucks because it happened to Caldwell last season and it ended his career as a starter in this league. This might not be as bad as that, but it still sucks. Look who led this season in tackles, Napoleon Harris. He had two good seasons in this series, we're six seasons into it, and he's barely had his second good season. That's not good. But at the same time, maybe that means there's more to come. Eric Barden has also shown that he doesn't work as well in the Jim Johnson scheme. Not that he's terrible, he's not, but he's clearly not as good. Randy Roger Roger, on the other hand, continues to show why he's one of my favorite draft picks in the series. Not as good as last season, but he's still performing as well as Barden in the scheme. I said it when I signed him, but I expected him to have his best season season with us. The man is getting better and better each season and we're benefiting from it this year. He clearly has a lot left in the tank and put up the most sacks ever in this series. He was worth it. The rookie Derek Watts is exactly what we needed, especially with Coleman being injured going to our first playoff game this season. He's going to be important. Left End 98 had a down season, but I think that had more to do with the fact that Wistrom was just getting there before anyone else could. Jim Watts Wilder became the fourth defensive tackle and was still out there putting up good numbers from that position. He did as well as Roderick Coleman and might be time to move on from him, but Depp is incredibly important in this game. It'd be nice to keep him. Andrew Mason hardly sees the field and can still get to the quarterback. He's definitely better than Williams who's backing up Wistrom. Norton, Antivirus, and Woodson both led the team in interceptions this season. I thought maybe Woodson might be regressing. Turns out, he's not. He's still very good. I wouldn't be surprised if he retires as a Raider. It took five seasons, but we finally found Rod Woodson's replacement. Norton, Antivirus, has taken the leap and made a name for himself. Dan Citrin has become so much better than I could have hoped for. He replaced Buchanan nicely when he needed to come in, and he He's a solid nickel corner. Derek Gibson continues to make me look bad by being so good. I'm sorry I called you the worst defensive player on the team. It was year one. I was young. I didn't know what I was talking about. Philip Buchanan had a down year, but he was never really a ball hawk except for one season. He was also injured for a month. I give this season a pass. Tommy Spoto had some play time. He got an interception. I'm happy with that. Seabass was better this season, but the question now is, could he have been even better? And I think so. And Leckler had his best season since 2005. I wonder if that had anything to do with me drafting his replacement. Our offense is better, but clearly this team is built to win on the ground and then in the air, which is why losing Collins hurts so much. The defense, on the other hand, took a big step back. I, I think they still did really well. Jim Johnson is now 20 and 13 as our head coach. He's been so much better than Callahan. And speaking of Callahan, he's the Texans head coach. They finished eight and eight, makes sense. He was never able to get over the hump. Trustman without Bledsoe is terrible. It's almost like you can't win games without a good quarterback. Someone should tell Bill Belichick this. Brad Johnson finished 6-10. and 10. That's honestly better than what I thought they'd finish. Surprisingly, we didn't get a lot of awards. Watts was 5th for Defensive Rookie of the Year. Wistrom was only 4th for Best Defensive Lineman, which is criminal in my opinion. John Norton was 5th for Best Defensive Back. These are all just for the AFC, by the way. Janica Kowski was the fourth best kicker. He shouldn't be here, but I'll take it. The worst, Jim Johnson was only third for best coach. He should have been first. Yeah, I'm a homer. I don't care. The Broncos faced the Jaguars in the wild card. Dolphins against the Ravens and the Ravens took care of Miami while the Jaguars destroyed the Broncos. I do not want to play the Jaguars. Thankfully, we don't, but instead we play against one of the best defenses in the league, the Baltimore Ravens.
A year ago, the Oakland Raiders looked as if they were going to blow up their team and start all over. Instead, Jim Johnson was given the keys to steer this team in the right direction. In his first season, he took the team to the wild card, but was one and done. This season, he won the division and earned a bye week. Can home field advantage give him the edge over the Ravens this week who snuck by the Dolphins in the wildcard round? They have a dominant defense and let's not forget they have a sleeper agent in Mozzarella Perella on this team. For the Raiders, they have to have some help from their big name free agents. Fred Taylor is one of them. He was injured but is 100% to go for this matchup. We start this game in the second quarter just before the two minute warning. Bowler, I hardly know her, finds his guy over the middle, threads it through and needle to get past the 40. The following play, Baltimore with momentum. Bowler drops back, throws deep, and it's picked off by Philip Buchanan. Nobody has an angle on him, nobody has the speed, and he's going to high step his way into the end zone for the first touchdown in this game. This secondary has been making teams regret throwing all season and today is no different. Just before the two minute warning, can Baltimore shake off the interception? Hard to do that when they get to him that quickly. Should change his name to number one because that's how many seconds it takes for him to get to the backfield. The Baltimore offense wasn't able to get anything going and will have to punt it away. Last year in the wild card, Buchanan had some trouble fielding kick. He had that interception for a touchdown earlier but this time he just fair catches. It. The Raiders have an opportunity for more points today. Douglas drops back, clean pocket, throws down the middle and right into the arms of McAllister. Just like that, the Ravens have the ball right back. How do they respond with it? It's third and 13. Bowler throws it to his right and it's picked off by Charles Woodson this time. I've said it already, but this secondary is not to be messed with. They have another opportunity to score. Douglas throws to his right and it's almost picked off by McAllister, but Terrell Owens snatches the tipped pass for the first. A few plays later, Douglas drops back, has time, finds Jolly Rancher over the middle to get the first. They're now inside the red zone. There's only 22 seconds left in the half. Ravens bring the blitz. Douglas finds Robinson, but he can't hold on to it. Third down now, Douglas drops back, pressure throws, finds Jolly for the first, but not the touchdown. This means they settled for a field goal before the half to put them up 10 nothing instead of risking running the time out. Remember last season the same thing happened instead of going for the touchdown they settled for a field goal. Had they had the touchdown they would have won. Instead with seven seconds left Baltimore has a chance to return this and he fumbled it. Raiders recover with one second left on the clock. That means Janikowski will come out and give this team a 13 nothing lead going into the half. We're now midway through the third. Ravens haven't been able to get anything going against the Raiders defense, having to punt it away once again. This time Buchanan has the sideline and we know he has the speed, but not the angle. That was a touchdown saving tackle right there. It would only lead to a field goal attempt by the Raiders. Janikowski will put them up 16 nothing. Skipping to the bottom of the third quarter, Raiders with the ball once again. Douglas finds Fred Taylor, runs over a man, and has the first down. We're now in the fourth quarter, Raiders still up 16-0. Taylor with a great block, Owens with a catch and tight coverage. Off-season additions getting rough and dirty here. Following the pass to Owens, they hand it off to Taylor, breaks a tackle, fumbles it, and Baltimore recovers it. If you're wondering why they haven't put up any points on Oakland, that's why. They're going to have to punt back to Oakland and Buchanan almost broke one earlier. This punt is a far kick, not much air under it. Buchanan fields it at the 40 and nobody has the angle on him. Nobody is even close to him. He's going to score the second touchdown in this game. At this point, all Oakland needs to do is run the clock. They hand it to Taylor and he fumbles it again, recovered by Baltimore. There's still a lot of time left in this game. Three minutes remain as Bowler, I hardly 
Luckily Noah takes off with it and tries to get the first down. They're now just outside the red zone, Bowler over the middle, and the Ravens score the first offensive touchdown in the game. They can still make it a two score game with a conversion here and Lewis gets it on the ground. At this point they have to go for onside kicks, score again, then another onside kick and stranger things have happened and the Raiders recover but they fumbled and Baltimore comes up with it. It didn't lead to anything as the Ravens would have to punt it away at the two minute warning. It's a head scratching move. You think they'd want to try to go for it but instead it's Oakland's ball. All the Raiders need to do is run the clock. They go back to Taylor and he fumbles it for a third time and yes the Ravens recovered. It was a big brain play to punt it and force a fumble to get them into the red zone but offensively they haven't gotten anything going. It's now fourth down could be the final chance for the Ravens. Bowler throws to his left and it's dropped. That will be the game. Without scoring a single offensive touchdown in this game the Raiders will move on to the AFC Championship game. Six points on offense, seven on defense, seven on special teams, 14 by Buchanan. I think I think we can say he won the game for him. Over five years ago, the New England Patriots were able to return to the Super Bowl when they beat the Oakland Raiders in the tuck roll game. We've returned full circle, except this time, it isn't to move on to the AFC Championship game. This time, it's to go straight to the Super Bowl. Back in Foxborough, and I'm sure the remaining players on this team that were there last time are hoping to finally get their revenge this time. The weather isn't looking too nice. I'm sure some players would rather have snow than the wet cold rain. Considering that last week Taylor fumbled it three times, the rain may not be his best friend. On the first drive of the game, Oakland's ball, Douglas drops back, clean pocket, finds Owen over the middle, past the first down, and he fumbles it. Oh. <laughs> recovered by New England. The rain is already having an effect on this game as Brady has all the time to throw and right into the arms of Barden. Back to back turnovers. The rain isn't going to be anyone's friend today. Throwing might be difficult to do but Douglas has no problems finding Terrell Owens who breaks the tackle, avoids another, stiff arms the defender, breaks another tackle before finally being brought down but fumbles it and New England recovers it but it was revealed Reviewed, and this one was overturned. Owens had his elbow down. A play later they go to their most dangerous weapon, Erickson. But he fumbles it and this time it stands. New England's ball. They were able to avoid giving up any points on their last drive. Patriots over the middle and it's picked off by Action Jackson. It bounces off of Barden. I think he was surprised that Brady threw at him again. First play after the turnover, they're inside the red zone. Douglas drops back, throws over the middle, and finds Duff Man for the first offensive touchdown for the Raiders in the playoffs and the first in this game. We skip to later in the first. New England unable to move across midfield. Buchanan had two touchdowns last week, one on an interception, the other on a return, and this is going to be his third touchdown in the playoffs. Nobody was even near him as he makes this a 14-0 game. It's now the final seconds of the first half. New England added a field goal, but they have an opportunity here after this return to add three more points to cut it down to a one-score game. With five seconds left, 53 yards in the rain in the cold and it bonks off the post and in to cut the lead to eight. We move on over to the start of the third quarter. Patriots continue to struggle to move the ball, but they're still within one score. They're punching it back to Oakland. Buchanan with the return. He already returned one for a touchdown. That missed tackle means he's going to score another one for a touchdown, and that's four touchdowns for Buchanan in the playoffs. Nope, this isn't a replay. New England couldn't move the ball at all all in this game punting it here once again Buchanan will be on the return he already had two touchdowns and make it three returns in this game four in the playoffs five in total they're now up 28 to 6. If you want to know what kind of game this was, it was returns for touchdowns and interceptions for this defense. New England wouldn't be able to do anything in this one and Oakland would win 28 to 6, getting revenge for the tuck roll game and moving on to the Super Bowl.
It's been five years since the last time the Oakland Raiders were in the Super Bowl. They've only scored one offensive touchdown during their entire playoff run, but they've still managed six touchdowns, all thanks to Philip Buchanan as their return man. The additions of Fred Taylor and Terrell Owens is nice, but with Duffman out for this game and Mo Collins, who turned out to be the reason why this offense was so explosive, they'll have a tough matchup against the Seattle Seahawks. The Raiders defense will have to prove once again that they're legit against Sean Alexander and Corn Robinson, while Matt Hasselbeck will have to convince us that when he has the ball, he's going to score. We'll start the Super Bowl in the bottom of the first quarter, Hasselbeck over the middle where he finds his fullback to get into field goal range. Sean Alexander is one of the best running backs in the league, but it's hard to get anything when you're getting hit five yards behind the line. They're at the edge of field goal range, and they're now going to be out of field goal range by that stuffed run by Watts. The drive would end up stalling there, forcing them to punt, and with the way Buchanan has been playing, that's probably the best outcome you could hope for as a Raider. This punt pins them inside the 10, which is the best thing that could happen since the Raiders offense hasn't been the most explosive, forcing them to punt from inside their own end zone, giving the Seahawks great field position back to where they were before Seattle punted earlier. This pass will get them back into field goal range, but a big injury happens here. Randy Roger Roger had to go out with an injury to his elbow. Same drive, third down, they pitch it to Alexander the Great who spins but bumps into Eric Barden who stops him before the first. This would lead to Josh Brown coming out to kick a field goal from 50 yards out and it's no good. Anytime you see the punting unit out there you think, is Philip Buchanan going to bring this one back for a touchdown? He's going to field it near midfield, makes a juke, runs around the defense and brought down at the 35. Same drive under two minutes. Douglas drops back plenty of time, moves to his right and finds Jolly Rancher to get inside the red zone and pushes inside the 10. Can the Seahawks have a defensive stand? They bring the pressure. Douglas to the end zone and it's dropped by Jolly. It's now second down. Douglas drops back with time to the end zone and this time the interception is dropped. It's third and goal and they're going to pass for a third straight time throws to Owens but knocked away great defensive stand. Oakland has struggled to score touchdowns in the red zone, but they at least got the first points in the Super Bowl. There's still plenty of time left in this half. Hasselback steps back and drops that into a bucket for a first down. It's second down, closing in on midfield. Hasselback gets great protection, throws over the middle for Robinson for the first down. It's now third down. They're just on the edge of field goal range, but Hasselback wants to be in touchdown range, finding Robinson in the red zone. Following that big play, Hasselback slings it to his fullback on the short out. Great block by Robinson to get him inside the 10 down at the 5. First and goal, less than 30 seconds left in the half. Hasselback has time, moves to his right, throws and almost picked off. It's now third and goal. Hasselback moves to his right, throws back to his left and Mr. Touchdown scores the first touchdown in the Super Bowl before the half. We're now in the third quarter. The Raiders will start with the ball in the second half. The returner isn't going to be Buchanan, but Robinson. He has the blocks, bounced to the outside, but doesn't have the speed and tackled near the floor. 40. Same drive, third down to keep the drive going. Douglas drops back, clean pocket and finds Robinson to get to the other 40. Third down again, Douglas drops back, no pressure and finds the most dangerous weapon on offense to get them into better field goal range. It'll be from 50. Josh Brown missed short from here earlier, but Janikowski has no problem making it a one point game now. We skip to the final three minutes of the game. Score still the same. All Seattle needs needs to do is run the clock. They do that here with Alexander. On second down, four yards can end the game. They hand it to Alexander, runs over Harris, but Roger, Roger cleans up the tackle. On third down, before the two minute warning, they hand it to the backup running back. Fumble recovered by who else? Philip Buchanan. Now all the Raiders need to do is get into field goal range and run out the clock. Taylor with the catch, breaks the tackle, downed inside Janikowski's range. It's third and 
25 and they want to get a little bit closer. Douglas finds Caldwell to get them inside the 30. They're at the 24, plenty of time to work with. Douglas finds Hello Mrs. Robinson's boy to get inside the 10. The Seahawks were able to stop them last time in the red zone. They keep at it with this tackle on Taylor on second down. They go back to Taylor up the middle, spin move, and tackle two yards short of the end zone. It's now third and goal. They go back to Taylor up the middle, but he can't get anything and Seattle is all out of timeout and with this kick, Janikowski just gave the Raiders the lead. There's less than 40 seconds left in the game. What can Seattle do? Hasselback off his back foot, finds his guy and stride to get across the 40. After a spike, there's only 27 seconds left in the game. Pressure in his face and he somehow gets that out to Whedon to get into field goal range. After the spike, Seattle isn't going to take a chance. It will be a 53 yarder. Brown missed short from 50 earlier. Can he squeeze enough out of his leg to make this one? It bounced off the bottom goal post. It's no good and Oakland is going to win the Super Bowl. It was a defensive struggle, but this might be the first Super Bowl in NFL history where the winner only won with field goals. That's going to wrap up this series. I find it funny that Janikowski was someone I was getting frustrated with over the years and yet he won this game for us. To be fair, the defense was great, but the offense couldn't get into the end zone in the red zone and Jim Johnson made us relevant again and this team doesn't need my help rebuilding anymore. I didn't plan on going to the Super Bowl in year six. I thought maybe I would end the series in year seven but either way it's done and I had a ton of fun. I'll see you all in the next video.